that my slide has changed for you? Yes. Great. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, so you know, firstly, uh, the, the, there are currently estimated to be 218 million women uh, around the world who want to use contraception but do not have access. Uh, each year, this leads to millions of unplanned pregnancies and consequently hundreds of thousands of preventable deaths. And 10% of those uh, will be the result of unsafe abortion. Women and girls with unplanned pregnancies are, are less likely to finish school or gain employment. Uh, as a result, uh, are largely, uh, can be socially and economically disadvantaged. Um, so MSI exists to deliver on the global consensus that reproductive rights uh, are a precondition for women's empowerment and that women's equality is a precondition for securing well-being and prosperity of, of all people. That's how we try to, how I try to encapsulate this. Um, and so uh, our, our mission statement is to ensure women can have children by choice, not chance. Uh, and MSI delivers on this primarily by providing contraceptive services and safe abortion services. All right. So if we if we try to look at the scale of the challenge here, and, and I again acknowledge that um, you, you folks are probably pretty familiar with this stuff and uh, possibly more so than myself. Um, but uh, looking at the scale here, um, this graph shows us the total fertility rate uh, in a number of selected regions of the world, um, that being the average uh, number of um, children per woman. Uh, and we see a decline over time, as you can see in these, these colored lines, um, in, in every region of the world. Uh, something uh, certainly that is, you know, can be considered a success. Um, but uh, despite that, this, this number of 218 million women uh, with an unmet need for, for contraception hasn't, hasn't changed very much. Um, certainly not in the last 15 years since uh, there was uh, a sort of a lot of fanfare around, around the publishing of um, uh, the previous figure of 225 million and, and an acknowledgement of what that meant. Um, so why, uh, why isn't this really changing that much? Well, uh, there is greater awareness of contraception uh, and, and unmet need for contraception is a self-identified um, indicator. Uh, but there's, of course, also lower infant mortality rates and continued population growth around the world, regardless of declining fertility. Um, we also have a number of regions of fast growing population, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and West Africa. Um, and then finally, we have a need as a family plan, you know, in the family planning community uh, to serve the base, we would say. So to continue serving all the existing users of family planning um, uh, and to build on that, uh, you know, in order to bring that number down, we have, to, we have to do what we're doing now and then we have to do more. OK, so it's it's the, the challenge is, is considerable. Um, looking uh, in at a few individual countries. Uh, these are five countries uh, out, out of the, the 37 where we are working that have uh, that do have fast growing populations. Uh, and again, a focus there on uh, West Africa. <clears throat> um, and then here we see uh, population numbers themselves, not not the growth rates um, of, of some of those regions we saw earlier. Um, uh, we see plateauing in, in, a, in a number of areas, particularly in East and South Asia over time. Um, and that's a result of declining fertility rates, you know, that are happening now. Um, but there's continued, you know, considerable population growth uh, in, in raw numbers uh, in, in East and West Africa and, um, and, and in some other pockets of the world. So these all contribute to, you know, the kind of the overall population picture, which um, I'm sure you're you're also all very familiar with, uh, but again, that uh, I think one of the important points here is that this, you know, firstly, it's not plateauing anytime soon, um, and secondly, the amount of efforts uh, and funding required simply to keep uh, to keep that graph looking as it does and not even improve it is um, is immense. Um, yeah, so. Um, the, the, the challenge is, is, is great. Um, back to Mari Stopes International, or MSI. Um, we started in 1976 
Uh, we're now a, a global partnership of 37 health service and uh, product sales organizations. We have offices in London, where we're headquartered, and Melbourne, um, which is the home of uh, MSI Australia, which I head. Uh, we also have a fundraising office and in kind of an increasing presence in the US, in, in Washington, DC. Um, the team here in Australia, there's just 12 of us, uh, and we manage programs in Cambodia, PNG, and Timor. Uh, we also do fundraising for that region and, and the, the broader partnership, uh, and we do advocacy work in the Australian community and, and particularly with these. MSI is, uh, is an in, uh, a not-for-profit NGO, um, but we are also a social business, which is something uh, quite core to the DNA of the organization. Um, and, and that means we, we seek to generate revenue both through grants uh, and donations, primarily, primarily government grants, but also fee-for-service models uh, where we seek to blend uh, our, our, our financing both through uh, uh, sort of sustainable business practices as well as um, uh, grants. Um, we, uh, I should note, because you might have seen this or, or will see it, um, the, the name of the global organization of Mari Stopes International has recently been changed um, from, from Mari Stopes International to MSI, Reproductive Choices. So MSI is no longer an acronym, but the name itself. Um, and this is because uh, the, the organization was named after uh, Dr. Mari Stopes, who, who ran a family planning clinic, uh, I believe the first one in the UK in the 1920s, uh, and so was a pioneer in her field in that way. Um, it also transpires that she had uh, a, a belief around eugenics and, and other practices that I don't think were well understood uh, at the time that the international organization was named. So um, we are stepping away from her name uh, and retaining MSI. Um, and uh, that process is just underway as well as in, in Australia. So we are actually still Mari Stokes here at the moment. But I just mentioned it in case uh, you might have seen some news, news press around that. Uh, the final point I would make in trying to sort of summarize the organization is, uh, is, is the importance of uh, our focus on results and on data. Um, which is, is completely central to uh, how we work and how we achieve what we do. Um, which, which brings me to um, our global impact uh, last year, 2020. Uh, and I'll just confirm you, we're still on track. You can see a slide that says 2020 global impact. Yes, it is. Yeah, great, good, okay. It's a bit nervous after. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, so our, our work globally last year in, in, in family planning um, uh, resulted in 32.6 million people um, being, being using a, a method provided, a family planning method provided by MSI um, by the end of the year, um, and 27.3 million family planning CYPs. Now, I... That, that is a that's an acronym that we sort of live and breathe, um, but I, isn't well understood out of out of the sector. Um, but that that stands for a couple year of protection. Um, so uh, we um, it's like a common currency um, for uh, measuring family planning uh, services. So if you have, for instance, a short term method, it, it it represents a portion or a fraction of a CYP. If you provide a long-term or permanent method, it, it provides multiple CYPs. And I'll get into that. I'll talk about some of the, the methods um, we primarily focus on in, in a minute. Um, but the, the CYP thing is really important because it, it enables us, it's a standardized metric that enables us to, um, uh, to generate the, the, the estimated health impacts of what we do across countries, if that makes sense. So the future health impacts of the services we provided last year um, can, can be modeled uh, to, to estimate uh, 35,000 maternal deaths that will be averted, uh, 5.6 million unsafe abortions that won't take place, uh, and 13.4 million pregnancies uh, that, that, won't, uh, that won't also won't have taken place. And finally, um, considerable cost uh, savings to, to healthcare, national healthcare systems, estimated at 1.1 billion Australian uh, in, in the aggregate there. Um, 
So I, I, I'll, I'll just sort of quickly focus in on, on you know, what those core methods are that, that we tend to, um, to deliver. Uh, the, sorry, so there's four, there's four you see there on the top half of this slide and, and beneath it, that, that chart shows the growth in our delivery of those, of those four methods, types of methods. Um, so the yellow one and the, and the, the line sort of running along the bottom of the chart it, it are permanent methods, serializations. So we do vasectomies and tubal ligations. Um, the green one would be uh, intrauterine devices or IUDs. So obviously that's a, um, a long-term reversible method, um, either five, to ten, five or 10 years generally. Uh, implants, contraceptive implants are the blue bar and that's probably the sort of takeaway out of this slide is the growth globally in, in the, um, the demand uh, for contraceptive implants, um, which are hormonal, hormonal methods. It's uh, one or two little rods, depending on the, uh, the device uh, that go into the arm and generally last three to five years. Uh, and then finally, we, we, we provide short-term methods as well, oral contraceptives, uh, hormonal injectables or, or condoms. Um, but we tend to sort of lump those together. <clears throat> okay. Now we, uh, we deliver these family planning methods through um, sort of standardized service delivery channels. Um, these are more or less rolled, you know, implemented in a standard way across the globe and within our, within our organization. Um, we have static centers or, or clinics, uh, which are kind of the, the original um, uh, service you know, off offering uh, for, for the organization. We do mobile outreach services. Um, the, the intent there, of course, being to reach communities. Uh, we have something that we've kind of coined MS ladies, which uh, is, is modeled on the US uh, Avon ladies um, sales, uh, system, uh, where we are trying to tap into um, uh, kind of entre individual entrepreneurs, health providers in, in generally developing countries um, who we can train and supply with commodities, but then they can then make their own living out of, out of providing them. Um, public sector strengthening. So increasingly, while we've done a lot of uh, we found it sort of necessary to do a lot of work directly on our own. Um, increasingly, uh, we uh, are, are seeking to engage with, with government uh, health systems to, to increase their capacity and hand these things over. Um, we, we have a lot of uh, contact centers or, or call centers uh, because we need to engage with our clients um, in, in that way, um, uh, both as health information uh, services as well as sort of booking systems, et cetera, wh ways to connect with uh, the women who need our, our services. Um, social marketing uh, is, is basically product sales. Um, so this is something MSI does to a, a considerable degree. Uh, it isn't our primary focus. There are a few other organizations, global organizations who, who focus solely on um, providing family planning through, through commodity sales. Um, but it is important. Uh, it is an important methodology to make sure um, we're engaging. You know, we're, we're getting contraception out, out to, to, to communities through uh, through private sector means and not just um, uh, directly providing it ourselves. Uh, the final uh, delivery channel there, social franchising, um, and this is uh, a methodology whereby we um, we connect with existing. Uh, private health providers um, who might be single operator uh, midwife nurses or midwives operating out of their own home or from from a from a clinical business, um, but we would work with them to brand them, train them, equip them, and bring them into a network uh, in the same in a similar way to to like a food like a fast food franchise. Uh, so that's kind of how we do what we do, and then uh, I thought I'd better. Um, 
try to try to connect to uh, to, to our people, um, the, the people on the ground who sort of do this do this work on our behalf. Um, Rosalita uh, is someone we we spoke to uh, recently for some for a communications piece, so I thought I'd just put that up on the screen. Um, she runs uh, one of our outreach teams in the Western Highlands in in Papua New Guinea. Um, and she had to say, you know, sex or reproductive health is not something that we freely or openly openly discuss with within our homes, especially with our children. Uh, I meet so many William, women and young girls who end up having one child after another simply because they don't know about family planning. For many of these women, MSP and G's outreach clinics are the first time they are exposed to these ideas. We talk to the young men and fathers about the growing shortage of land, the increase in the price of goods, school fees. The women know these struggles all too well. I think that's a pretty, pretty common uh, experience um, within our, our, you know, our, our teams. Uh, I th this is this is an image from from our program in Timor. Um, this is one of our staff uh, working at a public health facility uh, where we are working to build capacity and uh, of the government system and and encourage them to introduce this. Uh, you know, what, basically what we're doing, including not only the services themselves, but some of the methodologies that we're using. Um, Timor is, of course, a highly Catholic country with significant barriers to, uh, to family planning access uh, socially as well as in other ways. Um, however, uh, in the past 15 years, the total fertility rate in Timor has decreased from 7.8 children per woman to 4.2. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm really proud that, that we've been a big part of that story. Um, that, that, that coincides roughly with, with the period of time we've been working there. And um, we provide about 50% of the contraception services in, in East Timor. Uh, this is a picture from Cambodia, the, the third program, as I mentioned earlier, that we directly manage. Um, and our focus there really is on the clinical network um, where we have seven clinics nationally um, which we run as, uh, as a social business um, and uh, are nearing the point where we, uh, we won't require any more donor funding and we'll be able to, um, you know, it'll continue uh, on its own essentially as, as part of the, the health system there without, without. Um, isn't often achieved. Uh, a note on climate, um, which I think is of interest to, uh, to all of you as it is to me, um, but I thought I would clarify um, that there are, because there are difficulties in, in attributing carbon emissions reductions to lower birth rates in, uh, in the communities that we typically work in, um, and, and also for, for MSI, because there are very acute risks to our reputation and funding flows from any association, association with uh, notions of population control, um, despite our unequivocal commitment to voluntary informed choice. Um, as a result of these things, we don't really seek to actively position ourselves uh, as part of a climate change mitigation response, though there may be considerable evidence uh, to support that. Um, but we do rather uh, see family planning provision uh, as an larger part of, of the international aid and, and international development agenda going forward. So um, th that tends to be, it might be a, what you see us talking about more than um, than on that sort of emissions reduction thing, but um, but it is it, it's also the case, of course, that that uh, family planning has a significant role in in um, resource con conservation and and natural resource management as well. Um, so a few notes on the funding situation. They're sort of um, and it's a big topic, so I'll, I'll, I'm just going to you know scratch the surface here, but. Um, the cost of serving the current base of contraceptive users globally is somewhere in the, in the vicinity of five and a half billion US dollars a year. Uh, and that's a, 
that, that's a combination of public sector, donor government funds, um, and, and the private out of, uh, out of pocket uh, sort of sector. But we would need roughly another 5.5 million to address Can't hear. Way where we would need to be in terms of global funding flows. Now we've just gone through four years of a Republican administration, um, uh, and uh, and and the the reinstatement of something called the global gag rule. Um, the, be, be, because of course the way things work in the U.S. and and the, the Democrats uh, have had control of Congress. The actual U.S. total funding levels to reproductive health, um, in my understanding, haven't actually gone down that much. Um, but uh, but key groups such as uh, ourselves, MSI and uh, IPPF, the International Planned Parenthood uh, Federation, um, have been frozen out entirely because of this global gag rule, which basically says if you provide abortion anywhere or discuss it, or would refer refer women to, to abortion services um, or provide education about it, et cetera. Um, you're, you're frozen out of, of any uh, of any U.S. funding. Um, so that's four years we were we were cut off from the U.S. They they also targeted the UNFPA, um, the key UN agency uh, on our on our issue. Um, so it has been a tough four years, absolutely. Um, it, it roughly in the area of sort of thirty million dollars a year. Uh, in lost funding to us and and also possibly you know depending on how uh what, what future future uh funding may have been available that, that number could could have been greater um but now you know we're in a position to sort of engage uh which is is a slow process though um to, to sort of get back on on track with uh, a bureaucracy like that um closer to home the australian aid program uh, has suffered about a 20 or 25 percent contraction um, since the Abbott government. Um, aid as a percentage of GDP is, is hovering down around 0.2 percent now, uh, nowhere near the, the global target of 0.7. Um, so the aid program in, in Australia is, uh, is, is a bit of a fraction of, of what it used to be, um, and that kind of coincides with um, uh, yeah, sort of long period of, of conservative government, but also of uh, the, uh, the, the merging of the, um, the aid department into, into foreign affairs and essentially disbanding of, of, of the aid department as, a, as an entity on its own. Um, with, with having said that, uh, Julie Bishop and, and now Maurice Payne uh, in, in, in the, the, the ministers, the foreign minister role, um, have been successful in keeping women and girls uh, at the center of the aid program uh, as it has remained. Um, and this, this has helped uh, family planning funding levels uh, and kept them really from declining significantly despite, despite the, that, that larger decline within the aid program itself. Uh, but finally, um, you know, and, and just really recently, the UK aid program, which has been uh, a really strong supporter of, of, of contraception, family planning, uh, and abortion globally over the past 10 years is now facing the prospect of essentially the similar uh, process and outcome to, to what we've seen in Australia as um, uh, the, their foreign affairs department is, is, has been merged into, into the foreign affairs bureaucracy. Okay, um, a few notes on, on COVID meant for us, um, which of course has been uh, a significant challenge. Um, we have worked, you know, what, one of our core um, focuses and, and concerns has been working with local governments to ensure that family planning services um, uh, have, have been designated as essential services throughout the pandemic. Uh, and we've been successful in doing this. Um, certainly in, in the three, three countries um, that, that I'm overseeing. Um, uh, so that, that's been important. Um, COVID is continuing to have an impact on, on service delivery though, um, for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and recent, the, the recent outbreaks in, in 
certainly PNG, which you'd be familiar with, but also Timor, um, have interrupted our service delivery. Uh, you know, women and girls have, have borne the brunt of uh, what we call the shadow effects of the pandemic. Uh, around the world, there has been an increase in girls leaving their education. Uh, there's evidence of a rise in unforced, uh, enforced underage marriage, uh, and, and definitely also in, in incidents of gender-based violence. Um, gaps in access to sexual and reproductive health care have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and globally, MSI Can't hear. Results uh, in, in an additional three million unintended pregnancies. Um, we'll, we'll see if, if those if those if that modeling turns out to be true at, um, at, at some point. Um, and finally, a key long-term concern is reduced support, though, by by donor governments uh, and and public um, as economic effects of the pandemic really start to bite over time. That that's certainly something that uh, we, we see as a big risk. So lastly, I was told I could make a plug, uh, so I will. Um, uh, you know, I think maybe just um, something I hadn't said yet and shouldn't shouldn't go unsaid is is uh, that investment in family planning is is such a cost effective uh, intervention. Estimates, estimates range, range on the return, but um, the, if I like to use the higher one, so I will, uh, which says that for every $1 spent, there is $120 in downstream savings and benefits. Uh, um, if you're interested in us, um, you know, any, any level of support is, is totally uh, valuable to us, uh, no matter how, how modest. Donations from the public allow us real flexibility to meet gaps and, and continue programming uh, between some of those larger government contracts that, that really kind of drive the big numbers. Um, but, you know, th there can be real challenges in, in, in making the, those continuous. Um, so us having a flexible pot of funding is, is so vital. Um, it also allows us to sort of, tar you know, expand our service provision in sort of really targeted ways um, uh, that, that, that we find really useful. Um, and then finally, public donations to us um, do are considered by the Australian government essentially to represent public support and they generate a matching component um, of about 20%. So there is, um, there is an additional benefit. Um, and 90% of our expenditure goes directly to our country programs, uh, to, to, to program, programmatic expenditure on the ground. Um, so there you go. Um, you know, uh, our, that can all happen through our website. Uh, otherwise, though, um, just any support to our uh, social media presence by you know, following or, uh, or sharing our, our, our content and, and our, our message is, is just completely invaluable to us. So, um, yeah, if that's something that you could help us with, uh, I you know, would be absolutely thrilled. Um, thanks a lot. That's all I had to say for today. Thank you very much.